Thanks very much indeed for coming this morning. My name is Richard Horton from The Lancet, and um, it's a real delight, very exciting to be here for the launch of this tremendous series on pneumonia and diarrhea. I want to do, normally people do thanks at the end, but I'm going to do a few thanks at the beginning. I want to thank, first of all, my extremely good friend and colleague Zulfi Buta for leading this tremendous program. Zulfi um, first approached me back in the beginning of 2012 about this idea. I know there had been work going on before that. Um, but really, over this extraordinary short period, brought together a tremendous team of scientists, um, some of whom you will hear this morning, um, and thanks indeed to Krista, to Shannon, to um, Liz, to Igor, and everybody on, on this whole program, um, to produce what is simply a fantastic piece of work. I'd also like to thank profusely the support of WHO and UNICEF, together with the Gates Foundation. Without that collaboration between agencies and the Gates Foundation, this project simply wouldn't have happened. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Yudani, because although you see me here, she did the work um, from the Lancet <laughs> side. So thank you, Yudani. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health for hosting this meeting today. Let me just say a word about the college. Um, there are many colleges in the United Kingdom, the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Surgeons, but you'll notice that the Royal College of Physicians is about physicians. The Royal College of Surgeons is about surgeons. The Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health is not about pediatricians, it's about children. And that's a very important thing because that's what this series is about. And so the values of this college, I think, support and underpin the values of this series extremely well. It's 10 years, I can't believe it, since we did our first child survival series. And some of you are old enough and have survived long enough to have been part of that series 10 years ago. Um, so it was part, that, that effort back in 2003 was part of, I'd love to say it triggered, but it was part of an extraordinarily important revival of international interest in the future of children. It was an example of how great scientists can come together to do great science to support policy and actually political change. And we've seen an extraordinary result over the past decade. When we started a decade ago, there was over 11 million children under five dying every year. And now, we can argue about the exact figure, but it's definitely under seven million children <laughs> dying every year. And that is an extraordinary effort. Now, we published uh, at the end of last year uh, a, a piece of work which we were very pleased to publish, The Global Burden of Disease. But there was one message that came out of that global burden of disease that I was not happy with. And the message that came out of that study was that we've had this amazing success for, uh, in terms of reducing under five mortality, and now it's time to move on to something else. Uh, and the message of that series was that having done the job on children, we now need to turn our attention elsewhere. Well, respectfully, I strongly disagree with that message. Uh, let us look at the context of where we are today. OECD last week published figures showing that there's a 4% fall in international aid, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. That comes after a 2% fall in international aid in 2011. And we're coming to the end of an extraordinary period of consensus around maternal and child health. The, the Millennium Development Goals, they end in 2015. So we're at a moment of precarious uncertainty. F funding is going down, not up. An era of political census is coming to an end, not beginning. And yet, as you are going to see over the next hour or so, we have the most remarkable and reliable scientific evidence to give us confidence to relaunch a child survival movement for the post-2015 era. And that is the prize that we hold in our hands, that we have the knowledge to be able to relaunch this global movement for maternal, newborn, and child health. They're all interlinked for the post-2015 era. And I want you to keep that objective in your mind as we hear the data presented today. Let me immediately introduce 
my friend and colleague Ian McConaughey from the college here, who's going to say a few words of introduction as well. But have a great morning. It's such a pleasure to be able to host. And um, I'm proud for today to have the relationships that we do. Uh, for example, Professor Bhutto is a founding member of the college, as it were, and it is a college of paediatrics and child health. Um, I remember I was, uh, as a trainee, I was involved in something called the Ceremonies and Regalia Committee, which was extremely pompous. Um, and as a trainee, managed to avoid us having ermine as training reps, for example. And one of the funny features was, you know, on the crest, the badge itself, there, there are hands joined across, yes? There's an obvious white arm and there's an obvious brown arm. The original design were that they were like this, almost pulling each <laughs> other apart. So we've changed in that time. And this is an ongoing process of, of recognising how important not just a UK focus is, but an international dimension. And with that, Professor uh, David Baum was really instrumental in putting forward um, the international officers the first of whom was uh, Peter Sullivan, who I think you may, some people may know, um, followed on by Steve Green, and now we have Steve Allen. And these are jobbing paediatricians who also have other jobs as well, but their intent and focus is to really raise the awareness within the college. Now, the college is not an entity by itself at all. Part of the success is due to the working relationships with the many other bodies that are involved, such as DFID, for example. And I, I bring up DFID because there are a series to bring you up to date. There are many projects now ongoing. There's the ETAT um, study, which is going on in East Africa. So ETAT, as you well know, uh, Elizabeth Molyneux with emergency triage and treatment. Uh, the initial paper, again, published in The Lancet a while back now, I think, a simple, and I should say, I am an emergency medicine physician. That's my background. I run a pediatric emergency medicine physician. And the concept of triage, ETAP, reducing mortality by 9%. It's enormous. It's simple, but really effective. Um, so there's an ongoing ETAP Plus project. There are global links, again, with different volunteering and exchange projects uh, by UK paediatricians taking six to 12 months placement. So actually becoming useful. I did do small stints overseas and recognized that it's okay for me to go over, but as an individual, you don't leave very much. And this sort of binding across, the sharing of information, the sharing is key. Um, so for example, there's a Ghana clinical audit project which is running at the minute, training pediatricians in Ghana's two main teaching hospitals in Accra and Kusami. So this information sharing of skills and knowledge bilaterally is key. Um, Myanmar, the Myanmar is opening up at the minute hugely, um, and that may be to its advantage or disadvantage. Not quite sure at the moment, because lots of people go to help, but there has to be a coordinated structure. One of those things that we're working with, having discovered that the Australians are, are doing the same sort of thing, is setting up focused, appropriate, advanced paediatric life support course teaching, but in a way that suits Myanmar, that adopts to Myanmar, that has Burmese, as I should say, formerly Myanmar, paediatricians involved throughout the process. So that then they take over the structure and it belongs to that community. So finding that out was very useful <coughs> because they hadn't met initially together. It was a serendipitous uh, joining of the two. And these sort of accidents really are useful, but it should be much more coordinated, as I think most people will agree. So that's a key element. Final thing to say, there's uh, child health development uh, courses run at the college and the uh, Royal College of Paediatrics and VSO fellowship schemes. I think there are about 10 um, volunteers who go through placements. Judy, um, are you there? This is Judy Haig, who's the senior administrator. Do you know where those 10 are distributed roughly at the moment? Uh, well, uh, the aim is up to 10, and at the moment I'm Thank you. Thank you, Judith. That's Judith Haig, who's our, say, our senior administrator. So I just really want to finish to say thank you so much for coming today. I can feel there's a wealth of enthusiasm and also scientific-based knowledge 
that goes along and combined in that combination I think can be really effective in terms of producing better outcomes for children and adults, not just in the developing world but universally. Thank you so much.